Uh, let us first open up in a word of prayer. Gracious and eternal God, our Father, Lord, we thank you once again for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord, with us with us throughout this day and your promise, Lord, to be with us forevermore, never to leave us or forsake us alone. We thank you, Lord, also for your promise, Lord, that when we sit down and gather in your name, that you will be in our midst. And we invite you not only to be in our midst, Lord, but to reign supreme, Lord, in our gathering. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide us this evening, Lord, into all truth, into all understanding, that our minds will be free from error, free from strife, free from any concern other than, Lord, to learn about you to be edified by your word and to glorify your name. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, we ask that you would teach us as you have promised to do through your word. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. We are going to finish chapter four this evening. Um, so let me, let us begin. Okay. All right. Um, so we were, uh, we had looked at verses four, one through cha um, six last week of chapter four of Philippians. We are going to be starting with verses, verse seven, um, and we're going to go all the way through verse 21 this evening. But uh, we need to just sort of uh, review where we are and, and remember that. Paul has been calling the church um, to be unified, um, to um, to be unified and to be committed uh, to one purpose, uh, and that purpose. Uh, and if the, he's taught us that that commitment to one purpose is what will not only protect us uh, from attacks from outside the church. Um, but also uh, against strife that is within the church. And remember in, in chapter in verse two uh, of chapter four, he started out with pointing out to a dispute between two women of the church that was threatening to divide the church. Uh, and he has given us direct directives in these first six verses that are meant to bring us back to that one purpose in order to deal with, um, with that strife. So we have been called to, to, to one purpose, um, as he reminded us in Philippians 2, verse 3, where, where he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose. And he identified that purpose for us in chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, uh, and I won't read all of that, but um, the the uh, highlighted portion of that in verses 10 and 11, um, that I may know him, the him being Christ, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. When we looked at that verse, we saw how it, uh, illustrated the whole process of salvation from sanctification, which is there in verse uh, 9, where it says that I may go have a righteousness that is derived not from the law, but through faith in Christ. And that is being having the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, which is what happens when we are justified. Uh, and then sanctification is when we know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And that is where we put our own flesh and our fleshly desires on the cross so that we can live by the spirit. That's the process of being sanctified where God removes from us uh, those things in our flesh that are displeasing to him. And, and the purpose being to attain to the resurrection from the dead. When we are resurrected from these deadly these earthly bodies and we receive a glorified body and we are removed from the presence of sin so that is the purpose to which uh, we have been called that is the purpose that that Paul urges us to be intent on to have as our highest 
goal. Remember, he said also in chapter three at verse uh, 14, he says, one thing I do, and that is to press forward, uh, press toward the mark of the upward call. And that is this call right here of God that is in Christ Jesus, the call to be conformed to the image of Christ. So what Paul is trying to teach us is that when we have this as our purpose, uh, one of the one of the benefits of that is that we will that strife will disappear at least from us, and and the fundamental thing one of the fundamental realities is I not have peace with you if I don't have peace with myself or within myself. And so Paul is calling us to this be united in this so that when we get into these disputes, our purpose then is not necessarily to win that dispute but it is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And one of the interesting things or the, the, the true things from Scripture um, is that, that this purpose is also God's purpose for us because he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to, be, to, be conformed, to become conformed to the image of his Son. Um, so that is God's purpose for us. Um, and so that is alignment with, with the purpose that Paul calls us to. And so what he is really trying to teach us is that our peace comes when our purpose is aligned, uh, our purpose for ourselves is aligned with God's purpose for us. When we are out of alignment with God's purpose for us, that's where our strife comes in. And we're going to see that uh, as we get deeper into to cha uh, chapter four. So, what, 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 so, so again, so Paul is telling us then is that, if, first of all, if you want to have peace within yourself, you must be aligned with God's purposes for you. And that's indeed what verse seven tells us, because it says that after we have fulfilled all of those directives that he gives in verses one through six, including praying, as he directs in verse six, he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so we want to look then at the peace of God, and we're going to we're going to notice that there are three things of significance about this peace of God. Uh, we're going to look, first of all, at how it comes. We're going to look at what it actually is and then what it does. Now, if you look at um, verse 7, if you look at the transition from verse 6, one thing becomes fairly clear. Uh, and that is, is that when Paul says... Um, um, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request, request be made known to God. There's nothing in between that, that prayer and the peace that God promises. So what we then see then is that the peace does not come from having our petitions granted by God. It comes from the, it flows out of the prayer itself. It, flow, it flows out of a prayer that itself flows out of the humility that God, that Paul is writing about and that he's called us to. Because all of what he writes, um, all of the directives that he gives us in verses 1 through 6 are designed to bring us to this humility where we are focused on the one purpose. Uh, we have the same mind, that well, that one goal and that is to be conformed to the image of Christ. So it does not come from having our prayers granted. It comes from uh, having our relationship perfected. It's prayer is not about getting things, but it's about perfecting our relationship with God. And we see this in the passages that are there uh, in three of them. Uh, first, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, and Psalm thirty-seven, four, and Matthew six, thirty-two and thirty-three. Those are all if-then clauses, and that is, if we do X, God will do Y. 
And we're going to look more closely at the, the passage in Second Chronicles in a moment. But for example, in Psalm 37, verse 4, he says, Delight yourself uh, in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Notice he does not say ask for the desires. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 32 and 33, the familiar passage from the uh, Sermon on the Mount, where he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And the promise then is that, and then all of these things will be added unto you. So what these passages are saying is that we focus on perfecting our relationship with God. And the things that and then God will do what he's promised to do, which is to give us the desires of our heart, to give us everything that we need. So it's about perfecting our relationship with him and not necessarily about asking for things. So that's where our peace comes from. It comes from from being aligned with God's purposes and seeking to perfect our relationship with him. Now. What the peace is, now, the, the, the phrase is, it is the peace of God, right? It is not peace with God. What do you suppose the difference is between the peace of God and peace with God? The scripture does promise that we have peace with God as well. The peace of God would be the state of being, whereas you feel that peace as God would, versus peace with God means you you no longer have a division between yourself and relationship with God. Right, right. The pe peace with God means that God no longer sees us as enemies, as hostile. He sees us as his children. So he is no longer angry with us. Uh, but the peace of God is, as as um, as Deacon Haynes pointed out, is is a is a state of being. It is it is something that gives us comfort. It is something that gives us peace. And notice, it is the peace that God Himself has. If you look at somebody, get go and look at John chapter fourteen and read verse twenty seven for us. John chapter fourteen, verse twenty seven. Notice what Jesus says about the peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Yeah, he says, my peace I give to you. Now, what's significant about the peace that Jesus has? I mean, what disturbs his peace? Nothing. Nothing. And why? Why? He's the Prince of Peace. Okay, he is the Prince of Peace. Because he's sovereign, he can do all things. Ah, because he is sovereign, he can do all things, right? And so, would he, because of his sovereignty, be concerned about something that happened in this world? No. 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 Right, because it all fits within his sovereign plan. He is sovereignly in control of that. And so that's the peace that he gives to us, right? So, and, and that means then that when things happen, uh, like earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, or sickness, or whatever, losing jobs, we know that God is sovereignly in control of everything, so our peace should not be disturbed, right? It means that we should be able to sleep like a baby in a den of hungry lions. It means that we should be willing to endure being thrown into a fiery furnace. It means that on a boat in the middle of a lake in a, in a storm, while everybody else is panicking, we should be able to sleep the sleep of the righteous. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 4, verse 8. Somebody go there for us. Psalm 4, verse 8.
Anybody have that? Psalm 4, Psalm 4 verse 8. Lay that I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Right. So, yeah, our, our, our peaceful sleep <clears throat> comes from God and we can sleep the peace of the righteous, uh, the peace of being in relationship with God. And that's what the, that's what the, the peace is based upon. It is based on the relationship that we have through Christ with God. And that we can uh, all is an unshakable, unbreakable relationship. Um, I've given you a couple of scripture references, um, and I do encourage you to look at Isaiah 54, 8 through 10 on your own time. We won't, we won't go through that this evening, but you're familiar with the passage in Romans chapter 8, I'm sure, verses 38, 39, which says that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So our relationship is assured and our peace stems from that relationship because the, the definition of peace, it comes from the Greek word irene. And the definition of irene peace is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And because of that assurance, fears nothing from God and is content, we're going to see that word later on, content with its earthly lot, whatever that may be. So it's a peace right. that leads to contentment that is based upon the reality that God, we have an unshakable relationship with the sovereign creator of the universe who is committed to loving us and to bringing us into uh, a perfected relationship with him. That's what our, that's the peace that we have been given and that's what it's based upon. So, and what we also need to understand what Paul also says in about this peace in verse seven is that it is beyond all human comprehension. And clearly it means that we don't necessarily understand the full dynamics of this peace. But there's another implication of what Paul says, um, that it is beyond human comprehension, that it means it is beyond our ability or through our own efforts to achieve peace, that the peace that we get from God far surpasses any peace that we could achieve on our own. Question. Right? Yes. Uh, does that mean we should have total absence of fear, worry, or anxiety? Absolutely. That's what he just said. And for example, in verse six, be anxious for nothing, give no thought for nothing. All right. So the, and, the, and the example is, is Jesus said he gives us his peace. What fear did he have of any of those things? What anxiety did he have? We should, uh, our relation, we are, remember, we are being conformed into the image of Christ. We're being made to be just like him. Okay. And so then, and we are given his peace. So we should have no anxiety. And indeed that the peace that, that, that uh, Paul writes about here is contrasted with the anxiety that he tells us not to have in verse six. Now we're going to look at in a, in a in a minute why we don't have that complete peace, why we do have anxiety and fear. We're going to look at that because uh, Paul writes about that as well. Um, but yes, we are we should have Jesus has perfect peace. That's the peace that He gives to us. That's the peace of God that Paul is writing about here in verse seven. Yeah. Other any other questions or comments? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, that's the piece that, that I skipped over Romans 8, 28, that allows us to understand that everything that happens, everything that occurs, uh, works together for our good. And that is that everything that occurs that, that God allows into our lives he does so for the purpose that he states in, in, in verse 29, 
which is to conform us to the image of Christ so that we can have a perfected relationship with the Father. And so if we understand that everything that we go through, the sickness, loss of job, loss of family or friends, um, whatever it is, whatever it is, that God is using that uh, to bring us closer to him, then that's how we can do what James says when he says to count it all joy. Okay, So we looked at how it comes. We've looked at what it is. Now let's look at what it does. Okay, it, it guards our hearts and our minds. In in Jewish literature, what does the heart symbolize? Does anybody know that? Can anybody tell us what that is? The seat of the emotions. No, it's more than the emotions. In Jewish literature. The heart represents all that man is, the emotions, the intellect, the will, um, all of the decision-making, all of the things that go into making decisions. Um, and our minds guard with the things that impact what our hearts do. So what Paul is saying then is that, and, and go back to the example that he started out with, uh, with uh, the conflict between Yodia and Syntyche. Uh, whatever their earthly dispute is, what Paul is saying is that if we want to avoid strife, then the peace of God will protect us from whatever impulses that threaten the unity of the church. We don't know what their dispute is, but if we are, if our purpose is aligned with God, if we are committed to being conformed to Christ, and that is our highest purpose. The, um, and then we will have the peace of God and that peace that, that comes from our assured relationship and the assurance that everything happens is just perfecting that relationship, then the, the earthly things that tend to cause division and strife will no longer hold meaning to us because we will be protected by the peace of God. That's what he promises that. He says that, that we won't be influenced by selfish ambition or empty conceit. There'll be no division of purpose within us. And if there's that, and if the church shares that, then there's no division of, of purpose and mind and spirit within the church. And that we will be concerned about and look out for the interests of the, of the community and others. This is what the peace of God will do for us as it guards our hearts and our minds. So, so, yes, Paul lays out some, some exacting directives in verses 1 through 6, but the promise of what, what God will do to me is a hallelujah moment um, because it gives us, it guards us from those things which cause fear, those things which cause division, those things which cause strife, those things which cause us to, to want to break apart and split apart and to break up the community. God promises to deal with that if we are united around one purpose. Same mind, same spirit, intent on one purpose, that purpose being to be conformed to the image of Christ. So when we... <laughs> So then, excuse me, then when we sit down to pray, and this was a question that we started to answer last week, the question was, if, if Paul tells us not to be concerned about uh, our, not to think about our own interests, our own concerns, what do we pray about? What we pray for is to be the, aligned with God's purpose for us, to have that proper alignment so that we understand what God is doing. And we understand and our, 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 our conviction that uh, everything that God is doing is to bless us and not to, uh, not to destroy us. We pray for that understanding and we pray for um, the, the enlightenment as to, as to what God expects of us in those circumstances. And as we talked about last week, how to glorify God. So I want to talk for a minute about an example of uh, of the wrong kind of prayer that I hear so frequently. 
Um, and it goes back to the passage, the familiar passage of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, when I hear how some people pray from this verse, I think this is what they are reading. If my people who are called by my name, blah, 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 pray, blah, 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 then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Because most of the prayers, if not all of them, that I hear are, Father, hear us, forgive us, and heal our land. And I understand that those are things that we should want. But if you go back and you look at the actual language of the verse, God says that if we do what is in the first part of that verse, then those are, that's something he's going to do. We don't have to ask him to do that. What we have to focus on, what this passage says, humble ourselves, pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. All of that is about repairing our relationship with God, where we humble ourselves and we take our rightful place as completely dependent upon him, that we pray and seek his face knowing that we have to repent, we have to clean up our lives because we cannot seek his face unless we seek him with our whole heart, and that is a heart that is not divided between what the world wants, offers, and what our flesh wants, but is wholly committed to what he wants, and turning from our wicked their wicked ways. <laughs> is the classic formulation of repentance. So what God is saying in this verse is, if you repair your relationship with me, then I will do all of this other stuff that you want. I will hear you because I'm not going to listen to you if you're not concerned about your relationship. I will forgive you. I'm not going to forgive you if you don't repent and I will heal your land. He promises to do all of that. We don't need to ask him to do that. <laughs> What we need to ask him for is help in humbling ourselves and seeking his face and turning from our wicked ways. I mentioned to you last week that Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 is an excellent prayer to look at as an illustration of what this verse talks about. We're not going to look at it, but I just want to commend that to you again to look at. But this is a prayer then about relationship. And if you look at the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, those, that reference was up there in an earlier page, that prayer is a prayer about relationship. The prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is about relationship with him. It says, hallowed be thy name. That means glory to God. And, and in reality, may I live in a way that glorifies God. It says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means I have to submit my will to his. Even the petition that says, give, give us this day our daily bread is a prayer about relationship, a relationship where we live in daily dependence upon God. So that, that entire prayer that Jesus taught us is a prayer about relationship. If we focus on the relationship, then God will focus on doing what he has promised to do, which is to bless us. And this is illustrated, I think, beautifully in this passage in Isaiah. The setting for this is the people of the nation of Judah was under attack. And rather than turning to God, the nation, uh, they were soliciting Egypt for help. And God said, don't do that. But they, they persisted in seeking help from Egypt rather than turning from their idols and, and turning to God. What God says to them, he says, this is what the Lord God, the Holy One, is, a Holy One of Israel has said. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust, is your strength. In other words, if you repented and rested in what God was would do, if you acted in the, the, the quietness that comes from confidence and the trust, the faith, 
of the, of the Lord, there's your strength, but you were not willing. So since you turned, so and you said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses, and that therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. 1,000 will flee at the threat of one man, you will flee at the threat of five, until you are left like a signal post on a mountaintop and like a flag on a hill. Now, those three verses were taken from the English Standard Version, but I took the, the verse 18 from the New Living Translation because it comes the closest to saying what the actual, the, the literal interpretation of the, the, the Hebrew language. And it's this, long, notice what God says, what Isaiah says about God. The Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and his compassion. You know, I don't want God to have to wait to show me love and compassion. Right? So what I need to do is come to him and come correctly. I need to come to him in repentance and in rest and in quietness and in trust. Because if I do that, he will show me his trans, his love and compassion. The English translation says he longs to show us his love and his compassion, but he can't do that. He won't do that if we're out of relationship with him. So our primary focus in any prayer we pray should be relationship focus. It should be focused on improving and perfecting our relationship with him so that he can show his love and compassion on us. He wants to do this, right? Questions, thoughts, comments. So, so the challenge then to us is to uh, not to be so concerned about what we're going through, but to be concerned about what our relationship with God is. Um, and so, and, and our relationship has to be one of repentance and rest and in quietness and in trust. And then the, we will have the peace of God will guard our hearts. Now, what does this peace look like? Uh, and that's where we're going to, can I get somebody, we're going to read from verses 8 through 20 of Philippians chapter 4. So can I get somebody to read those verses for us? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you heard, learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you were sh sure, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all 
and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now in our God and Savior be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to cover verses 8 and 9 after we go through what the peace of God looks like in verses 10 and 20 through 20. Uh, but let's look at what this peace looks like. Um, what is what is the what in, in verses 10 through 14, what what comes out to you from reading those those verses? Dependency on God. Dependency on God. Okay. Uh, no matter what the situation, Paul, God, Paul is trusting in God and is content. Contentment. Contentment. And what does it mean to be content? To know that God is fully in control and he will do what is necessary and what he wills to do. Okay, that that's why we can be content. But what does it mean to actually be content? To be satisfied. To be satisfied, mm -hmm. right? Trust and, him. And trusting. Mm -hmm. But doesn't it also mean to cease striving? Mm. Yes. I mean, if we're not content, right, we are striving for something to make us content. And we've already seen that striving, right, is a source of our flesh and, and is a source of quarrel. So, so contentment in every circumstance. And, and as, uh, as uh, Sister Sylvia pointed out, we can be content in every circumstance because we know the sovereignty of God. And we know that whatever circumstance we're in is part of God's foreordained plan for us. And that that plan is to bless us, to give us a future and a hope. So we don't have to worry about whether we have much or little, whether we're sick or healthy, whether we uh, have a job or don't or, or anything. We are content in, because God, ha because of the relationship that we have with God, that unshakable, unbreakable relationship that we have with God through Christ, and his promise, right, that all things work together for our good. So if we know this, if we believe this, why would we be anything other than content? And we also see that Christ is the source of our contentment. And, and most people take verse 13 out of context to say that I can do whatever um, uh, because of Christ who strengthens me. But that's not a promise of some supernatural ability to do all things. It's not a promise that you can walk on water simply because you decide you need to walk on water. Um, it's a promise that Christ alone is sufficient for our contentment. That being in him um, and being found, being found in him and having all the blessings that come from that is why we are content. And it's a promise of the transforming power of Christ. And we're going to look at that specifically when we look at why we don't have, why we don't always feel um, the contentment or the, the contentment that comes from peace with God. But it's, it's a promise that, that everything that we need to feel content, to experience contentment, is found in Christ. All right. We also, uh, yes. I saw uh, some people interviewing some homeless people, and they asked them how they felt about their situation, and they said they were content. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between their contentment and our contentment? 
there, you know, there are people that feel content simply because for for earthly reasons. The the earthly the the our contentment is a contentment that le- that comes from a relationship with God, and it's the promise of something far more glorious. Um, the the earthly contentment just means that I'm okay with suffering, and I'm okay with that being all there is. Godly contentment recognizes. Remember, we said that in the standing firm part, where Paul urges us to stand, uh, the uh, the Philippians to stand firm in verse one. That is with an eye on heaven and the things that are to come. Our contentment is is that God is taking us to a place uh, where there will be no suffering, no pain, no sin, nothing but no tears. So it's the contentment. You can be content simply because you don't expect anything better. You can be content because you're happy with suffering. But our contentment has something far more glorious attached to it. So what we also see, remember when when, when, um, Paul writes about the humility to which he calls us, it is a humility that looks out for others and not for ourselves. And isn't this what we see in Paul in verses 17 through 19? I mean, he he's thankful that the Philippians gave to him, but why does he say he's thankful? Look in verse 17. Because they will benefit from having given to him. They saw the need to to, uh, reach out beyond themselves, even in their own need, and give Mm -hmm. to someone else. Right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And this would this would be would be a blessing to them. And also God saw this as a sweet aroma. Yeah. Yes. So so they were going to be blessed because they had been they had given and so paul out of his love for others saw his physical needs as an opportunity for the blessing of the philippians and that's what he was concerned about not that he wanted of him, not that he wanted it for himself but he was, he was focused on the blessings that others would receive okay so again it's an outward looking Others looking focus um, that comes when we know that God's got us. When we know that God has us, then we know we don't have to worry about what we need or what we want. We just worry about, we just focus on blessing others. Remember, we said that when we looked at verse six, where it says, Be anxious for nothing, how difficult it is to focus on the needs of others if we are worried about our own needs. Mm -hmm. So we have to put aside our own needs and we can do that because we know that God's got us. And so Paul knows that God has him. So he's focused on blessing others and reminding them in verse 19 that God will supply what you need because God has said this himself, right? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the things that you need will be uh, added unto you. So Paul's focus is on blessing others. um, And it's also focused on God's glory in verse 20. Their giving, their suffering, their, their being willing to sacrifice glorifies God. There are our, our care for our brothers and sisters, our concern for the needs of our fellow brothers and sisters, glorifies God. So this is what Paul is um, uh, calling the people, because he says several times, imitate me, live as I do. He's going to say this again in verse verse 9. The things you have seen and heard and learned from me, do these things. Okay, and that is... 
not to worry about whatever situation you find yourself in. Be content. Recognize that that contentment comes from Christ. Focus on being a blessing, not on receiving blessings, but on being a blessing. And focus on glorifying God. That's what the peace of God looks like in our lives. And, and, and when you think about this, wasn't this the kind of peace that Christ himself exhibited, right? He was content. Nothing worried him. Nothing bothered him. He knew that his father, had, even going to the cross, he didn't want to go. But he wasn't worried about it because he knew that God had him, right? Um, and he was focused on doing that, right? Why? Because we needed it. So he left, and Paul in, in chapter 2, in, in verses 5 to 11, says he did not, cling to his divinity. He did not cling to his status as being equal to God, but he took on the form of a servant. He did that. Why? Because we had a debt that we could not pay. He was focused on not his own glory, but on filling our needs and glorifying his father. And as a result of that, God glorified him. And so that's what the peace of God looks like. That's what we should be. That's what should be showing up in our lives every day. Okay. Questions? Uh, people that are depressed usually focus on themselves. And one of the best treatments for depression is for them to start thinking about other people and be concerned about their welfare instead of just their own welfare. Yeah, not only people who are depressed, but people who are angry, people who are, I mean, vir virtually every emotion that prompts us to do whatever it is we do is um, a, a symptom of focusing on self. But if you put serving others as uh, your primary goal, then you don't have time to think about self. You have time. Your your goal is to address the needs of others that you're called to serve. So, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna summarize this by looking at those those signs that we can that we can use to detect when our purpose is out of alignment with God's purpose, and they stem from the things that we feel. Okay. So we want to look at, oh, okay, we've got time to do this. We're going to look at how to experience the peace of God. And this is what Paul deals with in verses 8 um, and 9. Um, when you, let's go back again to the example of Yodia and Sintiki. Uh, and you think about, divisions or strife, a strife or an argument in a church or a division that uh, the unity of the church. When you're in an argument, what, what are you thinking? What's on your mind? I it, want to uh, win. I'm sorry, in your flesh. I want to win. I want to prove my point. My way to, is the right way. Okay. Okay. I want to win. I want to prove my point. Anything else? Do you think about what happens if you don't win? Not a loser. Well, maybe, but you, but, but the fear, the fear of losing is what motivates a lot of competitors to win, right? Right. They think about they think about what's what's at risk. They think about what they're fighting for. Um, for example, when you're when you're sick, right? You think about your health and the implications of that. Right. And so we tend to then all of that then is focused on self. It's focused on, you know, what I want. I want to win. I want to prove my point of view. I want to avoid losing something that I value. I want I want my health. All of that is focused right on self. Uh, any wonder that Jesus says you want to be my disciple, you have to deny self. Right. But the reason then, the, what we then have to do is what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 12. We have to be renewed, right, by the transforming, I'm sorry, be transformed 
by the renewing of our mind. In other words, we have to change what we think about when we get into these disputes. And we remember, we have to, we've been called to the purpose, the one purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ. And so instead of thinking about how I'm going to win or how I'm going to avoid losing all of these things, we have to think about how is God using this to conform me to the image of Christ? And am I being conformed to the image of Christ? In other words, we have to change the way we think. As um, Pastor Dolby says, we have to change stinking thinking. Right? Right? And, and this is what Paul writes about in verses 8 and 9. We have to change our stinking thinking thinking. We have to align our thinking with God's truth and to elevate our thinking above earthly disagreements, right? So what specifically does he say? So instead of thinking about winning the argument, think about God's truth. Whatever things are true, the truth is, is that all things work together for our good. If, if we love God and are called according to his purpose. So winning the argument isn't the, a paramount concern. The paramount concern is maintaining our relationship with God, knowing that whatever comes out of this disagreement, whether I win it or lose it, God is working all things together for our good. And what I need to do is to be concerned about serving others and meeting others' needs and putting others' needs about my own because God's going to make that thing work out for my good. That's the truth of Scripture. So, instead of thinking about what we stand to lose, we think about the honorable privilege of knowing Christ through his sufferings and being willing to count all things as loss for the sake of knowing him. So what we might lose is worth nothing compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ. So instead of thinking about what I might lose, think about what you're going to gain through knowing Christ and that losing and that losing earthly things is a way to gain Christ. Again, changing our thinking, renewing our mind. Instead of thinking, you know, I deserve to win this, I deserve to have this, think about the holiness. That word right means the purity, the holiness of God, and how far short of it we fall. And that nothing we can do on our own can bring us into that holiness. So what we deserve, right, is not winning that argument. What we deserve is the eternity in the lake of fire. But what God does for us is he gives us the right, he gives us the holiness, and he is perfecting us to perfect holiness so that we can spend eternity with God. So don't think about, you know, I, you know, I should have, I should have that seat. That's my seat, or I should have that position. I no, I want the holiness of God. And it doesn't come from, from battling over petty earthly arguments. I don't care what they might involve. They're all petty with regard to uh, the holiness that, and the relationship with God. There's an old saying, said, there's an old book uh, saying that came out of the 80s, I guess, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. It is. So again, changing our thinking. Don't be concerned that life is not fair or I never get what I want, but think about eternity. God says that we are citizens of heaven, and that's and our mind ought to be on heaven. And we ought to think about the pure holiness that is required to spend that eternity with God. Think about these things. And don't think about what we're suffering. But think about how lovely our praise is to God in our suffering. Because it says to God that I trust you that I value my relationship with you more 
then uh, I'm concerned about this suffering. It says that we recognize the truth of Paul. What Paul says is that our suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. We have to elevate our thinking from those things that are always involved in earthly disputes and think about where what God is doing, where he's taking us, and, and, and how assured we are that we're going to get there. That will help us eliminate all strife. If we do those things, then what Paul prays for in Colossians, I'm sorry, the, the risk of harm versus the, you know, we, we think also about I'm giving up all of these things. Um, but we need to think about the faithfulness and the trustworthiness of God. Jesus said, um, uh, when Peter said to him, Father, we have given up homes and everything to follow you. He said, no one has given up anything that will not be returned to him a hundredfold in this world and in the world to come. And we need to think about God's faithfulness and his trustworthiness, that everything that we give up in this world will not compare to what he has for us. When we can renew our mind and elevate our minds to these things, then the peace of Christ will rule in your heart, as Paul writes about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. What this all tells me, one of the things it tells me is if I want to know if uh, my purpose, if, if my commitment to my purpose uh, of being conformed to the image of Christ is fully in alignment with God's purpose in conforming me, all I have to do is to examine what I feel. If I'm feeling anxious, it's not because God has moved. It's because I'm out of alignment, because he says that there's no reason to be anxious. If I'm feeling fearful, I'm out of alignment. God's not, because he has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, uh, love, and a sound mind. If I'm feeling angry uh, at the wrong things, there are some things we should be angry about, but Scripture says if I'm feeling angry at the wrong things, I'm out of alignment. My, my focus, something else is competing with my the purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ in my life. So check your emotions. All of them, and, and you know, our emotions are with us and they are real. Um, and we will deal with them as long as we are in this flesh. But they help us to understand not that somebody has done me wrong, not that somebody has taken something from me that I deserve. It is that I am out of alignment with God's purpose for my life. And that purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Yeah. Any questions? Thoughts, comments. Now, I, I'm going to need you all to tell my wife that we did get through all of chapter four tonight because she said there's no way. <laughs> it's, especially after I told her we only got through one verse last week. So I need you to tell her that. All I'll right. Be nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so this is uh, our last class for December. Um, we will re uh, reconvene for Bible study, I believe, in the first week in January. Um, and um, uh, yes. We will resume the second week in January. Okay, second week in January. Second okay. Week, yeah. Okay. All right. And, uh, I mean, just have to take some time to really thank Reverend Brawls for teaching such a great, great wow. lesson. Wonderful lesson. Uh, I've learned more about this chapter, this <laughs> this book, than I've learned in a, a lot of years mm. Mm. because of the way he has taught us. And yeah. I just, applaud him and his service as I applaud all of our associate pastors, mm -hmm. associate ministers. And uh, we are very fortunate 
at First Baptist Church to have such talented in Christ associate ministers. And I think Amen. We'll all of them are hallelujah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. All Reverend, glory to God. Reverend Briggs will be teaching the next lesson starting the second week in January. January 10th, correct? January 10th? 10th, yeah. And we are looking out for a hallelujah good time with his. We're in the mm -hmm. process of finding a an uh, interim pastor. When that in, interim pastor is secured, then we will turn Wednesday night Bible study over to him. But right now we're getting taught well. And I appreciate it and thank you very much. Amen. Amen. All right. I can't see you. Um, I'm sorry. No, I'm saying I can't see you all off of computers <laughs> messing up. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask. What is I'm the sorry. next book we're going What is the next book that we are going to study? We don't know yet. Uh, we don't know yet. Right now, he's working on oh, that. Okay. So when, when okay. he gets it, we'll have it in the news newsletter. Okay. All right. I will ask um, Deacon Ward if you will pray us out. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to, to study your word tonight. We've learned a lot. And we thank you for the instructor and the way in which he prepared to clarify your word for us, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will grow from it and become better Christians, that we will be at peace with ourselves, even in the midst of chaos, Lord, to grow and become better servants, better Christians, and better people. We ask it all in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.